Welcome to Insight, produced in partnership with Valley PBS. Today we are chatting with Stephen Ramirez, Chief Executive Officer of the California Health Collaborative. Stephen has generously agreed to share some of his experience with us. I'd like to thank you, Stephen, for joining us today. It's a pleasure to be here, Mark. So you cover an amazing footprint of not only geography of services and clients. Right. Talk about that footprint, the extent of, of the services that you provide and the people that you serve. Well, our offices are based here in Fresno, but we are a statewide organization, so we do cover a lot of geography, most of the, the whole geography of California. The mission of the California Health Collaborative is to promote the health and wellness of all Californians. And though the focus of the organization tends to be on rural underserved populations, we do have programs that operate in the urban areas of California. So we, are, we go as far north as the border to Oregon, Washington, all the way as far south to San Diego. So we cover a lot of territory. And the other area that we cover a lot of territory with our programming is that we have services and programs that go from prenatal all the way to seniors. So we're unique. We're not a single focused organization like cancer or lung or, or other types like that. We actually do programs in almost every area you can think of from senior services to dealing with um, maternal child health to teen pregnancy to um, issues of adult services and behavioral health, things like that. So we're pretty broad. It's exciting. It's an exciting time to be involved with those many things because it's all interrelated in the health field for us to be able to serve the communities of California. So. And you function as if health, the right to health, is part of the heritage of everyone in California, don't you? Well, I think that the, the mission and the purpose of why the collaborative was established was that we believe that health is a very important and essential function of life within um, the culture of the community. And um, we operate that way. Our board of directors is very strong in that belief and operate in many ways through partnerships with many other organizations, both public and private. We've had a great track record, PBS being one of the organizations, by the way, that we've worked a lot with here in the Central Valley and other parts of the state. Um, we're proud of that. We're proud of the fact that our philosophy and mission and our values are about trying to do the best we can to improve the health and wellness of all Californians, regardless of their status in life but with a particular emphasis on underserved populations in rural communities. So. How do you actually detect where needs have been, where needs are today, and where needs will evolve toward? Well, obviously we look at statistics and information in any one particular geographic area, but to be honest about it, Mark, how we approach the whole issue of the health of a community is we work with the community. We talk to the advisory groups, we talk to elected officials, we talk to citizens. A lot of times our information is more anecdotal than it is statistical. So there will be statistics that show there's a particular problem that's pre prevalent in one area. However, the anecdotal, the stories that people tell us help us to shape and develop the programs. Um, good examples are when we've worked in behavioral health in working with the issue of prenatal care and dealing with the issue of um, perinatal mood and anxiety disorder. That was something that evolved from a need from First Five, and I think First Five is one of the groups that you've been talking to here in Fresno, which is a great organization. They approached us about doing um, some surveys and research and talking to the community and finding about uh, the issue of, teen, of pregnancy, but also about um, perinatal mood and anxiety disorder. And what we looked at was what are the different issues that were facing women and their families in terms of accessing services. And what we learned was there are services out there, but they weren't being well connected. There was a systemic problem. And so what we did was really more work on systems change. How do we change the systems that are in operation and not build new ones, but work together to make them adapt to the needs of populations of women and families. And that was quite successful. And so now we operate programs here in Fresno and in Madera and looking at expanding beyond that in the Valley to serve more women um, and families at an early stage of the problem. So that's sort of how we evolve our program approach in almost any area you can think of. So. How do you go into uh, different communities, Punjabi communities or Hmong communities, or uh, you go into uh, different communities, African-American communities, Hispanic, you know, white community. I mean, there's so many different communities sure. here and there are right. barriers, right. right? One of the things that we're experiencing in the country is this sort of fragmentation and it's us versus them. Mm -hmm. How do you bridge those gaps? Well, I think there's always common elements amongst every culture. So I think in almost every culture, they would, they would agree that children and families are important and that everybody wants to have a, give a better life to the children and their family to do better for them. So we look at what are the common elements, regardless of the culture, that they can rally around and work on. And so we work from that perspective. Um, keep, keeping in mind what the cultural issues are or the cultural challenges are within those communities. And oftentimes the leadership of these programs comes directly from those communities. It comes from a Punjabi community, an African-American community, a, a Latino community. 
Um, and we work closely with them on those things. Once again, I think the attitude of how we approach this is that we don't own the program, the community owns it, and we're trying to share and facilitate to get them to the better health outcome. And that's the most important thing that I'd like to, to relate to you is that the ownership really lies with the community. And you were the author of uh, a professional guidebook to address the topic of cultural diversity. That's correct, you? yeah. So talk a little bit about that, that book and the authorship of that book and how that informs your management style. Right. Well, I think uh, when I um, wrote the book, I actually was approached by the Wellness Councils of America back in, in the early 90s about it. And I had, prior to that, had been doing a lot of national work with the Boys and Girls Schools of America, doing training and education on doing health promotion with very diverse populations. And they came to me with the concept of writing a book. And I told them, well, I'm not an author. I don't know how to write like an author. And he said, we don't want you to be an author. We want you to write what you're actually teaching in your seminars and things like that. So I took that as a challenge and I said, that's great. And so what I did was looked at what are the key elements dealing with um, cultural diversity, education, economics, and environment. Those are the three E's I call them. And in every community, regardless of culture, race, or ethnicity, it's important to address the education component, to address the economic component, and address the environmental component. With that, you can have a very successful health program. And looking at statistics nationally, that will tell you the truth. I mean, you can educate a population about the problem of disease prevention or about a particular cancer or topic, but if there's not an economic way for them to sustain themselves, to be able to live a decent life, if the environment around them is such that they can't get access to health care or don't have access to those things, then your, all your education is not going to be helpful. So you have to look at those three things. So that was sort of the foundation to the fundamental of the book um, that really I still practice actually today in many ways. How do you ensure that you are investing your scarce resources <laughs> in a way that brings the most benefit in a balanced way doesn't allow uh, cohorts of people that you wish to serve to slip through the cracks, but you're making intelligent decisions. How do you, how do you actually connect that ends and means uh, question? Well, I think that you know, the resources is important, obviously. So we have every program we run has limited resources, depending upon the funding source, whether it's government or private sector funding or even donations. But um, the most important part of this is partnerships. Um, we try to identify who are natural partners for us to work on this topic, and that helps us extend our resources into the community. So if we partner up with the school system, with health care providers, with um, human service or social service organizations, churches, and others, that extends our resources and its abilities. So for the one dollar we invest in terms of staff, you multiply that by five, ten, fifteen different organizations that we coalition with, there you get your biggest bang for the buck in, in underserved populations, particularly in rural communities where there's a great distance between services. So that's pretty much how we operate in those areas. So it's interesting because you're piggybacking on the credibility that your partners have Correct. with their with their constituents. Correct. You're piggybacking on the lines of communication and the fact that a church might be a gathering point where at least people right. come once a week. Right. So you can actually distribute services and, and information on services right. through that. Um, it, it's, it, it's such a sophisticated way of looking at what contributes to a healthy community. And, and it is so informed by this idea uh, that you converted into a book uh, all those years ago. Right. What do you think the, common, uh, the, the coming major health challenge is for, for the region that you serve, for the people that you serve over the next five years? Boy. I could spend a whole program on that. Um, there's a lot of different things. Um, I, I think the, the healthcare system becomes pretty overwhelming for a lot of people. Knowing where to go, how to use your insurance benefits um, is a complicated thing. Um, and we are in an ever-changing world of how the benefit structure works, right? You have different administrations, both in California and as well as at the federal level, that are constantly changing or evolving, you know, what the health care insurance plan should be. We need too many intermediaries. Right. Right. We've got multiple right. funding streams. Organizations right. are, right. They, they have de restricted uh, buckets in which they, they can only pull right. out so much money right. in this way or that exactly. way. They have to knit together the funding for right. any service that is. Everything is categorical. Every, everything is categor categorical. Right. Everything's subject to challenge. Right. The overhead of right. what we do right. and the waste. Expensive. It is incredibly expensive. expensive. Yeah. So one of the things that we do, Mark, is that we offer different programs that help people navigate the healthcare system. So we try to find people who understand how healthcare works within a particular area, whether it's breast cancer or dealing with um, mental health or dealing with senior services. And we hire professional staff, whether they be nurses, social workers, or other lay professionals who can help our clients and our patients navigate the healthcare system um, effectively. 
without having to try to figure it out through reading a book or going online, we actually have what we call warm handoffs where our staff will hand off someone to other agencies and say, listen, we have um, someone who's a client of ours that we want to hand off to you because they need your services. And therefore, that patient or client doesn't have to call three or four different people to try to get their help. So that's been effective for us. There are a lot of nonprofits that are doing much more today navigation programs, helping people navigate the health and social services system to better utilize their time and reduce their level of frustration and anxiety and get better outcomes, basically. Um, so that's something that I see occurring more in the future um, of healthcare, a lot more navigation systems. Um, you know, other things I think, you know, again, I, we were talking before we started um, filming this, um, social media has changed the whole landscape right. of the world. And of course, you and I didn't grow up in that. Um, um, we're adapting to it. Um, but I do think that social media is a very powerful force, both it could be for good, but also it could be for negative, as we've learned. And um, I do think that um, nonprofits and all institutions have to learn how to garnish the power of social media in a positive way and use it to be able to promote and educate and, and gather people around issues that are important regarding their own health care and their own um, quality of life. So I see social media being an engine that's going to drive us, those in the healthcare field, more into other areas we've never really ventured before. So for example, um, you and I probably went to school where you know, everything was classroom based. Well, we know now many things are not classroom based anymore. There are virtual universities, virtual schools. People go to school online now. People don't exactly use textbooks anymore. They use electronic books or electronic formats. That has changed how we do business in, um, in healthcare as well. And so we have to be mindful of how technology is affecting or impacting healthcare services and, and medical services in ways that we probably never imagined. And how do we stay on top of that and, and, and meet the needs of communities that are trying to adjust to, to these differences that we're seeing in, in the culture of our society, particularly on social media. Such an important organization, such an expansive definition of community health and such a sophisticated response to that definition. Stephen Ramirez, thank you so much for sharing the work of the California Health Collaborative and thank you so much for your insights. Thank you. Pleasure to be here. Thank you.